Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today, I have a very terrifying, exciting, and informative lineup of encounters. Before we get into those, though, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. My merch is displayed directly under this video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, of Volume 1, 2, and 3, the audiobook versions, they were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeffrey Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with today's upload, shall we? Today's first encounter. I was hunting by myself in this particular morning in some woods that I had been to many times before. I pulled in and parked in a spot facing away from the woods. It was maybe 5.30, pitch black, about a half an hour before daylight. As I was getting my gear together from the back seat of my truck with my back to the woods, I could hear something walking the wood line slowly. I decided to stop to listen and see if I could figure out where it was or what it was. The problem was, when I stopped moving, so did it. So I went back to loading my rifle. This happened two more times. I was a little nervous about going into the woods at this point because I don't know what or where this thing was. But I had my 270 rifle and my 357 revolver on my hip, so I figured I was fine. I walked a few feet into the tree line and looked around. There was nothing. So I made the five-minute slow walk in the pitch black with no flashlight. As I arrived, I found a big tree and leaned my rifle and backpack against it, popped open my hunting blind as I bent over to put the first stake into the ground, something sounding as if it was standing directly over top of me, made a snarling growl so deep it almost vibrated me. The growling grew into a high-pitched scream like a woman. My hair stood on end, so I stood up and turned around with my hand on my revolver ready to fire at any sound or movement, but nothing was there. I stood there for a moment, looking into the darkness, trying to make sense of all this. I figured at this point it can see me, but I cannot see it. It followed me, and if I leave, it may see it as a sign of weakness or retreat and attack me. So I grabbed my stuff and sat waiting for daylight, and didn't hear or see anything else. People try to tell me it was a dog, coyote, or bear, the problem is, I'm 6'2", even bent over, I'm at least 4 foot. I'm no small guy. This was standing right over me. Plus, when I stood up, I never heard anything move. No leaves, no sticks. There wasn't any big trees close except for 10 feet away. Plus, it was smart enough to watch me. Stop when I did, so I couldn't triangulate where it was. Then walk around me to come behind Someone I know who had a similar story seems to think it was Indian spirits. This happened about 50 miles south of St. Louis in mid-November. It has a lot of Indian history and hieroglyphs all over the area. Today's second part of the upload. My mother grew up near northern Wisconsin. She shared with me some stories a while back which happened to herself, her brothers, and some people in the area. Some of them I feel worth mentioning. Now, I've had my own paranormal experiences, but at this time I feel they are quite difficult to talk about. A little bit of backstory on my family. My mom grew up rather poor on a junkyard in the country in northern Wisconsin. For anyone who is not familiar with Wisconsin, this is the part of Wisconsin that tends to have long stretches of forest and a lot of beautiful nature and scenic views. One of the stories my mom told me was something that happened to a family that apparently lived nearby. This family was driving through the forest and eventually their car broke down. This would have been the 70s before cell phones, so they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the long journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started noticing sounds behind them, as if something was following them through the woods 
or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their home, and they quickly entered, slamming the door and locking it. Whatever was following them gave out a bellowing scream. Apparently, the family had alerted their grandfather as to what had happened and told him to look into his fields. According to my mom, he had apparently come back into the house wide-eyed and alarmed. But he did not elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mother talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field, though. I'm unsure if this is related or not, but my uncle went horseback riding with his friend, and they apparently came across this thing. Apparently, it was white and furry. When it saw my uncle and his friend, it stood up on its hind legs, bounded over a fence, and ran off. It left behind some fur which my uncle collected, but this would have been many, many years ago, and my uncle has since passed when I was about four years old in a bad accident, so I'm unable to ask him about this. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to this, black bear, wolves, dogs, etc., all would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it is apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would be mistaken identity or not. What does interest me is stories of the Wisconsin slash Michigan dog man. Could it be related? If it wasn't a case of mistaken identity, I don't know. I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress. And there is darkness in this world, be it supernatural or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and the loved ones. Today's third part of the upload. I live in rural Idaho, about five miles from the reservation. Growing up, we heard all sorts of stories and legends surrounding the res. I'll have to admit, I was a bit skeptical when it came to things we heard. My best friend and I have always been drawn to the paranormal. When we were about 16, maybe 17, we decided to go for drives on the res at night. The area we live in has a very tight-knit community, and our little town was just over 10,000 people. We basically had no crime and everyone feels pretty safe, so driving around at night was no big deal. We went on our night drives fairly often with no experiences to note. One day we had heard a story from someone at school about an abandoned schoolhouse on the other side of the reservation. Just past that schoolhouse there was supposed to be a small bridge that went over a large farming canal. The story has it as if you drove over that bridge and turned your car off. You could hear water babies. If you don't know what water babies are, there are many different stories and legends stemming from Native American cultures. Have a look-see. So anyway, we decided that that was going to be our next driving destination. Neither of us had ever heard a water baby cry, so we were pretty interested. That night after dark, we jumped in my car and started driving out there. The closer we got to the schoolhouse, the more uneasy I began to feel. We drove past the building that was supposed to be the schoolhouse and stopped on the bridge. I cut the lights and killed the engine. Silence. There was no sound but the rushing water below the bridge. We sat there for what felt like forever. In reality, probably only four or five minutes had gone by. We heard nothing but the water. We started joking about the story being fake and decided that it was a bust and to just go home. The keys were still in the ignition, so I simply tried to start the car. Nothing. The dash lights lit up, but the car wouldn't turn over. I'd never experienced any problems with my car before. I tried a couple more times while talking to my friend, not wanting to freak her out. About the third or fourth time, I turned to her and said, I don't want to freak you out or anything, but my car will not start. Her eyes grew wide and she responded, You're messing with me, right? I wish I had been. We sat there for a minute just staring at each other, not knowing what to do. If we called my mom, there would definitely be some ass-chewing for being out on the res so late at night. We decided to call one of our friends that had a truck. 
If the battery was just dead, he could give us a jump start. If not, he could tow us back to town, so we called and waited. Sitting in the middle of this bridge in my dead car, frustrated from the lack of experience and car troubles, we just wanted to go home. That's when I saw it. It's a well-known fact that the Rez has packs of wild dogs that roam around killing livestock. There have been a few instances of them attacking children and putting them in the hospital. This was no dog. I've seen coyotes and wolves, and there is no way in hell this thing was either one of those. It was skeletal, like a malnourished animal, and it was walking on all fours, slow and low to the ground. It was walking along the canal toward the bridge. I smacked my friend, making her turn to look at what I was staring at. We both stared in disbelief at this creature slowly coming towards us. Instinctively, I honked the horn. At least that still worked. This is where things got really strange. This thing stood up on two legs, arms limp at its sides. I legit screamed. I had never seen anything like this in my entire life. The best way I can think of to describe it is that it looked like Professor Lupin's werewolf form in the Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban movie. It was friggin' massive. It stood between eight to nine feet tall and was staring right at us. It took a couple steps forward. My friend and I were frozen. We were trapped in my car that wouldn't start. As it slowly started to walk towards us, headlights appeared in the distance. As the lights came closer, the creature dropped back to all fours and took off for the hills, where I assumed it had come from. Our friend pulled up to help us, and both my creeped out friend and I kept quiet about what we had just witnessed. He walked up to the car, I rolled the window down. He suggested we push the car off the bridge to the side of the road and pop the hood. So I threw it in neutral and got to the side of the road. My friend asked me to pop the hood and to try to start the car, so I did. The damn thing started right up. I don't know what caused it not to start before, but that night I had an experience I will never forget. I don't go out to the res anymore at night. I'd really rather not see whatever that thing was again either. Today's fourth part of the upload is a historic legend that was talked about back in the day in Georgia. Very interesting. One of the more curious paranormal incidences in Georgia is the Georgia werewolf, Emily Isabella Burt. Apparently, Miss Burt was a resident of Talbot County a rural county in southwest Georgia between Macon and Columbus. The Burt family, a wealthy and prominent family in Talbot County community, had several kids. All of the children, it appears that Emily Isabella was the one with the most problems. For one, she had inherited a lot of physical traits from her father, including dark hair and bushy eyebrows. However, she was said to have had sharp white canine teeth that made her smile quite disturbing. In one report, Robert claims that Emily Isabella's mother took her to the local dentist to see if her teeth could be altered in any way. He could do nothing for her. Soon afterwards, she fell ill and suffered from restless nights. Emily is said to have strangely wandered the county during her restless nights. Legend has it that a bow of one of Emily Isabella's sisters, William Gorman, reported to the Burts that he saw something killing his sheep. Fearful that this may soon be happening to her animals, Mrs. Millard Burt became quite concerned. On ensuing visits, Gorman would recount stories about how more sheep killings and that more of his cattle were killed as well. He was concerned about the killings and decided to take action. He reported that he was going to be putting together what amounted to be a posse. Their intentions were to shoot and kill whatever beast was doing the damage. Emily Isabella was unusually interested in what was going on and what events had transgressed in the hunt for this animal. On the night of the big hunt, Millard Burt, who was also said to inherited more than a few guns, was also a great markswoman, went out with her pistol. 
She apparently suspected that Emily Isabella was somehow involved with the killings, and she wanted to be prepared for anything. As she was near the area, an animal lunged for her and she fired. It ran away. Interestingly enough, the next morning it was reported that Emily Elizabeth had a bullet hole in her left hand. After being taken to the local physician, her mother decided to send her to Paris to be treated by a doctor who specialized in lycanthropy, a disorder that made its victims think that they were werewolves. While she was in Paris, the attacks stopped, and once she returned, supposedly cured, the attacks fell to a minimum. Emily died in 1911 and is buried in a small cemetery out in the wilderness of Georgia. To this day, a number of paranormal incidences are reported in the area, with the grave itself generally believed to be haunted by the ghost of a werewolf. People report a strange stillness or sense of unease around the cemetery, and the grave itself is strangely well kept, even though the cemetery itself is overgrown and forgotten. Others have reported that when small tokens, chips of stone, etc., are taken from the cemetery, bad things happen to those people not long afterward. There are even some people who know that even just talking poorly of Emily or her family cause the same problems to happen, as if the werewolf does not want others to speak ill of her. I always found that very interesting. Um, I remember like the first time I heard it, instantly I was thinking about like the American werewolf in London, the American werewolf in Paris and stuff like that, and just wondered if those movies were based off of that that legend um but yeah definitely just a, an interestingly cool uh story i'd love to someday go to that cemetery and check out her stone um of course i would be respectful i'd probably bring gifts with me but anyway let's move along today's fifth part of the upload I've had two unsettling experiences. Both occurred in central North Carolina. I lived out in the boonies, so there were a lot of pastures and woodland. The first incident came when I was a younger teenager wrestling with the recent death of a sibling in extraordinary anger. My home life was not stable and I spent a lot of time out in the woods when things got bad. I even spent the night outside when I didn't feel safe inside. The forest around my house was essentially a second home and I had no fear wandering around for hours in the darkness. After the most violent argument to that date at home, I decided to take off in the woods for the night. I left the house early and went into the woods the angriest I had ever been. I remember I ended up screaming, crying, and punching at a tree for a while, until it clicked into my head that there was no more sound. North Carolina summers don't exist without the screaming of every kind of insect at all hours of the day. From there, I noticed an encroaching foul odor. I know what dead animals smell like, hello country living, and this was like that, but much worse and more intense. Also sweet. Dread started to set in, and as I turned to start walking back home, my instincts were screaming at me to run, so I did. I was a chunky teen and running was not in my wheelhouse, but I was running quickly enough that I crossed the several acres of our property in what felt like seconds. The entire time running up to crossing the property line, I heard something keeping pace with me from behind. I couldn't see anything from the deck, but I did hear heavy footfalls in the distance. The odor went with them. After that night, I never felt safe in the woods. I never went back into them. And if I had to be outside at night, every outdoor light was on, and I stayed far from the tree line. The next event occurred roughly five years later, still a teen, less angry, and still in the country. Left for college and work one morning, and crossed the dead doe in the middle of the road, one that turned onto the road we lived on, less than a quarter of a mile away that required I drive partially. The ditch to avoid hitting her, 
not an uncommon sight, but I made note of it since I would be coming back at night, and if no one had been out there to remove her, I ran the risk of startling and hitting any nighttime scavenger that was in the road. The day was normal, other than the unusual late shift at work courtesy of a surprise inventory. By the time I left, it was nearly one in the morning and raining. I took my time coming up on where I knew this doe had been and caught some eye shine on the left, figuring it was a stray animal or a fox taking advantage of an easy meal and glanced in my side view mirror while I passed. It made eye contact with me in the mirror and went from what I am now certain was a crouch to a standing position in an instant. It was tall, I'm dead certain of it. The head looked canine with orange slash green eye shine, the upper body all matted down with rain. It was too dark for me to see much more other than what I was already seeing. I was driving pretty quickly. The same odor from the previous experience was in my car. The same dread had me taking the turn that took me away from my home and into a 40-minute detour. I ended up calling my parents and begging them to turn the outdoor lights on for me. I booked it to the door once I was home. I never took that road to or from work again. I've not encountered that odor again in the woods especially. Those around my home still feel like they don't want me there. At worst, that tingle of dread will keep me from venturing too far into them. Where I live now, more city than country, what little woodland exists in my immediate area is so thick with homes that any negativity feels like weak and muted. I'm not sure what I'm expecting out of sharing this, but I've never told anyone out of fear that I'd be ridiculed for saying some kind of demon chased me in the woods or that I saw some kind of dogman thing chowing down on some roadkill. Today's sixth encounter. To let my dog outside, I use a steel cable runner with two steel cables for the dogs themselves. This setup is in my backyard in front of a somewhat small wooded area that they will usually walk into if something happens with their cable. Last night, one of the dogs whined in a way that had me poke my head out and check on them, at which time I noticed one of the dogs was missing, finding that where the cable had frayed had worsened and snapped, one dog loose with a few feet of cable still attached. I mention this because the dog rarely barks or makes noise on its own, so you'd have to yell their name, then be perfectly still to listen for movement of leaves or the clink of the collar and connector to find them in the woods. This has happened several times before, so I head to where the dog usually does, heading straight toward the woods, with a strong pen light looking for the shine of the collar or the eyes. After going further into these small woods than I'd ever gone before, starting to lose hope, I come to an opening where I distinctly see eye shine to my left, and have no doubt that I found her. I take a few steps, and at the bottom right of my vision, there's also another pair of eyes. Now my dog loves other dogs and animals, so it also seems likely that she had gone towards another dog to play with it. However, neither pair of these eyes were moving. They weren't interacting with each other. They were trained on me. If I had called her name, she would have paused for a moment to look, but If another animal was there, they would have quickly resumed playing. Both eyes remained on me. I could see two sets of eye shine that fit the spacing for them to be eyes. I never slowed my pace in moving toward them, but as I got out of the brush, both sets were gone. I shined the light in both spots as I came closer, and there was nothing reflective that I could find which might have fooled me. A moment ago, I had thought the search was over. I found out later that my girlfriend was not too far behind me also seeing the eyes, though they immediately struck fear in her. She had the same moment of there they are, noticed the second set and hesitated, and then where'd they go? 
I worked my way across the clearing and to the other side of the forest, reaching the neighborhood houses on the other side before turning left to circle back through. As I'm moving down through a small gully, I see again a single set of eyes. They are at the bottom of this small ravine facing my direction, two eyes looking at me as I call out my dog's name. I again think the search is over, but I jam my shins into a branch on the ground and go down. When I get up again, the eye shine is gone. At one point, the apparent shape of a house cat was fleeing in my flashlight at shoulder level, but I couldn't find the front of it to catch the eye shine as the shape was moving too fast and my brain said that's not a dog. I stopped to reorient myself. At no time during any of this did I hear the chain clink or steps movement through the leaves. My girlfriend trailed far behind me to denote that I could hear her movement and could not see the eye shine this time. None of this seemed very odd in the moment, but my adrenaline-fueled search. But after we got back to the house and talked about it, it felt strange. The dog has gotten off the cable several times before without breaking the chain or cable or leads, to the point where I began to make poltergeist jokes. As I'd find her in the woods with 20 feet of cable behind her with no breaks, just take her back and reattach. These are normal connectors with a pullback spring and a C-shape. Anybody with thumbs can, openly, can easily open it, but dogs do not have thumbs. This has happened five times where there is no failure in the equipment or collar, yet the dog is free. I have never seen anything before last night like this. It has more often than not just looked like somebody walking up and undid the cables. The dog was found in the opposite direction of where I had been in the woods. So whatever it was, what I saw, there was not a dog I was looking at. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed tonight's terrifying lineup of encounters as much as I enjoyed sharing them with you. Um, I want to thank everybody for all of your support. It truly means the world to me. Also, I'd like to encourage everyone to be kind to each other. And with that, may the Great Spirit watch over all of us and guide us in this path of life. With that, my friends, farewell until tomorrow.